This is the Hog Division meeting at the 1981 NFO Convention at Indianapolis, Indiana. ...to the 1981 convention. Uh, this morning I have with me Walt Hackney, the director of the Livestock Division, and without any hesitation I am going to turn the meeting over to him. He will speak, be speaking to us just a few moments this morning, and then he will be taking in the other commodity meetings. So at this time, Walt Hackney. You, you guys are going to, and ladies are going to cause me a lot of grief if you don't stop stopping me. See, I got to hit all four of these meetings here, and I'm, these guys have got me on a, on a schedule, and uh, they holding my feet to the fire, and I get uh, about halfway to the next course, I'm crippled, and I move slow anyway. <laughs> And then these, somebody will stop me out here in the hall, and that slows me up. And uh, Merle, I haven't got any excuse. I'm five minutes late. I tried everything I could think of, and I, that's the best I could do in the short time I had. I don't like to start meetings late. And I think it's an imposition on you folks that made an effort to get here on time for us to be late getting going. So I apologize for that, and I'll take the blame for it, Merle. The Livestock Department... And I emphasize livestock department. Uh, we really are. We're happy that you're here. Uh, we're especially happy in the interest this convention seems to be showing the uh, livestock department. You know, we're kind of cocky about the position we have as a department within the structure of the National Farmers Organization. I happen to be extremely proud of the men and ladies that are in the livestock department that work most closely with myself out of the national office. Merle Sunken, the director of the hog division, Larry Sills, the head negotiator, the other men and ladies in the other livestock meetings that you will attend today. These people have spent a, an unbelievable amount of their time developing a skill to most adequately represent you at the marketplace. I hope that it's appreciated because I happen to have an enviable position of being able to sit in Corning and watch them perform. It's, it's an honor, actually, to be associated with these employees of yours that represent you in the various livestock departments. I, I really want you to, to believe in that because it is a fact. Quite frankly, when I attended my first convention of this organization out in Omaha, Nebraska, four years ago, uh, I couldn't say that. Now, I couldn't say it for a couple reasons. First of all, I was director of the cattle department, for one thing, and then there was the hog department over here in left field, and the feeder cattle department over there in left field, and the sheep department down here in foul ball territory, and nobody in the livestock departments respectfully knew what the others was doing. And that's a fact. We had employees working for cattle or hogs or feeders or sheep, but whoever they had worked for in their specific department, they were told if you go out and solicit a hog and you're a cattle employee, you're fired. Type, type of stuff like that. Two years ago, uh, I was asked if I would become director and unify the livestock department. And, and when people say, would you do that or would... Would I do that? Those kind of words always irritate me because there isn't a single person can do the job as big as this darn job is by himself. All I did was discuss it with Merle, with Andy Nutzling, with Gary Ellis, with Dick Hammond, explained the problem as it had been laid out to me that it had actually been fragment, fragmented and it needed to be pulled back together. You'll notice in the livestock uh, brochure booklet that, had, that we worked out this year, when I say we, I didn't have a thing to do with it. 
the departments, again, together, work that book out. I think it's better than the convention book myself. Of course, I'm maybe partial, but I think it is. I think it's more informative. I think it's better laid out, and I think there's been a hell of a lot more thought gone into it. And I'll tell you, you go through that cattle, hog, feeder cattle, and sheep portions of that book, and you can't help but represent the whole darn department as an employee. They ain't got any choice, in other words. You only got one thing to carry, and it includes all four of them. So you, if you can't do nothing else, you can at least read up a little bit before you go into a producer's place and let him know that at least we got other divisions within the department. There's one other thing that I'd like to hit on. It's, it's become very evident in the last couple years that the livestock department has spent too much time dictating programs that have been, in fact, some unpalatable to the membership in specific areas. What I'm referring to is it's very convenient on a national level for Sunken to design a national program that fits everybody. Well, it just, it's been done by hog department, by any department within the livestock. And it just isn't palatable to some areas. You know, a feeder program, for instance, in Kentucky, just simply can't fit in Montana. The conditions are different. A hog department, a hog program, rather, in Georgia cannot be the same as a hog program in northeast Iowa. So what we've done, we took a little bit of a lesson from the memberships. Us so-called technicians, that's a pretty powerful word, but us guys that are supposed to have all of those answers, finally, I think, wised up here within the last six months. And we realized that we must hear the membership and what fits their respective areas and then design with their help a program that is customized for their specific area in marketing, whatever product, in your case, hogs here today. A case in point, and I don't, Merle hasn't gotten into it and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but I was the one that brought it up first yesterday so I can mention it again. A group of members and non-members through the help of collection point personnel and a national director and just darned interested people in northeast Iowa that needed a market desperately on hogs got together. They customized their own program. They didn't ask us our opinion. And it turned out to be one of the nicest ones we got. It's a blocked string of hogs around 100,000 head. They put them together. They done all the legwork. They did everything but the step that we seem to be able to do best, and that's market. They did everything else. They put them together. They handed them to Merle, and then he went to work. He did an excellent job, but I don't know why anyone wants to hand him a rose for doing an excellent job because that's what you're paying him to do. You know, it's like thanking a dentist for pulling your damn tooth. You know, that's what he's supposed to do if it needs pulling. Well, he needed to market them hogs. He did a super good job, and if he hadn't have, there'd been no advantage to you as a member to participate to start with. But that was put together by the membership. Well, that's where we're heading this next go-round, fiscal 82. It's going to be more from you to us so we can work together to make a program fit your specific area rather than through a blanket program from Georgia to Montana. It just don't work. With that, I'm on a hush because I got I to gotta leg it on up here to the feeder cattle, but I really do appreciate the chance to get to get around like this. These guys are all making fun of me attempting to go around here this day, but I'm going to tell you what, I get more out of it probably than you members do. And it's a good opportunity for you, for me to maybe relate to you without getting into the respective program that you're sitting here waiting to hear.
So with that, Merle and Larry, I'll hush, and good luck to you today, and thank you all for coming. The next few moments uh, for the possibly the newcomers into the room here today, possibly this may be uh, your first convention, and I would like to spend just a very few moments on the structure of the hog division. Now, I'm going to talk about the hog division. Walt just spoke to us about the meat department, uh, including sheep, feeder cattle, fat cattle, and hogs. But now we're going to focus in just on the hog division. I'd like to run through our structure for you. And if I could have the lights, please. Uh, we will shortly run through the structure and show you the team that has been put together, uh, not just today or yesterday, but over the years through the National Farmers Organization program and so forth. Up at the top of this screen, you will see the word producer. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, without you, the producer, this organization is totally helpless because we don't have any hogs being raised in the uh, home office at Corning, Iowa, those hogs have to be produced by you, the producer. So, yes, you are the number one. You're right up there on the top. You're the number one because without your production, we don't have a program. Underneath that, as we be producers become members of the National Farmers Organization, you may become a elected meat committee person in your county. So then you form a county meat committee consisting of normally five producers. From that, if you have a collection point and possibly a two or three or four county geographical area, then you would take from that meat committee at your county level and form what we call an, a collection point meat committee. This is nothing more than a tool that I and Larry and our staff people can use to get quicker results from the collection point. This is kind of our sounding board. The collection point meet committee is the committee that is responsible uh, a little closer to us than what each separate uh, county committee is. These people are our sounding boards, we get information to and from them, and as we go through uh, and you attend the uh, collection point meeting just being held across the wall here today, you will find out the sole purpose of having these people elected, and they will be represented in a monthly meeting where they can express their thoughts and information and receive information. Just beneath that, we have the word collection point. And that is the collection point where we gather hogs and feeder cattle, fat cattle, cull cows, and all species of livestock. Just off to the right side of that, you see the word collection point board. Well, that collection point board is a group of people that uh, represents that facility, that physical building. And they're nothing more than the land, and don't take that uh, derogatory, but they're nothing more than the landlords of that facilities. They are responsible for the physical uh, woodwork of that facility. And uh, I just uh, didn't want you to get that confused with the meat committee, because they are two separate functions. Now, a lot of the collection points, the uh, people have purchased those out in the areas. The group of uh, people have purchased the collection points, or a lot of them are leased by individuals, or they might even be leasing a sale barn. But nevertheless, there's normally a barn board that is responsible for the that particular facility. Just underneath that, you see the word uh, commission staff. At each one of these collection points, we have normally two people that is paid on a commission basis. One of those people are called a custodian. The custodian's responsibility is to handle all the physical monies that are spent as far as paying for the livestock, paying you producers for the livestock, and in most cases, of course, it's done on the draft system 
instead of a particular check. But the custodian is responsible for handling all the monies as far as being paid out for livestock. doesn't matter whether you're talking about hogs, fat cattle, feeder cattle, or sheep. Uh, off to the right-hand side of that, then you see the collection point manager. The collection point manager, uh, his responsibilities or her responsibilities in a couple of cases are they actually weigh, grade, and sort the hogs and are responsible for putting up those hogs, uh, representing the National Farmers Organization, you producers, with that individual packer or and possibly a feeder calf uh, way up uh, uh, the individual producer that would be purchasing those feeder cattle. So that are that is their responsibilities. Just beneath that, you see the word regional supervisor, cattle rep, feeder rep, and sheep rep. Uh, in our case, in the hog division, the word regional supervisor is a full-time salaried staff person that works directly for uh, the hog division at the home office. Now, we have some 19, 18 or 19 of these people in the country. They are salaried staff people. They have a area of responsibilities that normally cover from one to four uh, collection points. So now we're getting a pretty good team of people put together. We don't have all the areas covered. We have some uh, 75 to 80 collection points totally covered with this type of staff and responsibilities. Uh, we've still got some to go, but even the collection points that don't have a full-time staff working right directly in their behalf, they are also invited uh, back to a monthly meeting where we hope to have all collection points involved in a once a month meeting where we can give out information where we can keep that meat committee collection point board completely informed on all the programs, on all of what's going on throughout the division. Of course, underneath that you see the four divisions, hogs, cattle, sheep, and feeders, uh, which uh, would include myself here today. Underneath that, of course, is director of the uh, livestock division, and our case is Walt Hackney. That is the team that has been put together throughout the livestock division and throughout the organization. I'd like to carry that one step farther this morning and tying on a team with the packer. And I don't want you to take what I'm going to say wrong. I want you to understand it the way I mean it and possibly not the way I say it. I want the packer to be on our team. And I'd like to give you an illustration, and it's been used already this morning as Walt referred to Eastern Iowa putting a block of hogs together. Well, this group of people you see on this overlay here put that block of hogs together. They put that block of hogs together. We then negotiate them, but at the time of the negotiations, the packer agreed that if we was to get together and the producers would ratify that agreement, then they would send out their representatives from the packing plant to work with our representatives, the collection point manager and the regional staff man in that particular area to show them exactly how they wanted their hogs put together to make sure there was no misunderstanding. Uh, you know, nobody's perfect. But uh, they want to work with us as a team. And I think that has been done. Well, be a fact, I know it's been done, but I think that's been one of the greatest steps that we've been able to achieve in the past few months and few weeks. And that is making a team effort with the Packers and the National Farmers Organization program. I'd like to carry that one step further and saying that the day will come that when the National Farmers Organization and the Packers are working as a team on good contractual sound basis, that it will give that Packer the opportunity of going into the retail chain 
and explaining to them that they can no longer go to the weakest link to purchase their product, and that being you, the producer, they can no longer purchase that product and shove the price down the th producer's throats like they have throughout the past years, that it will give them the opportunity of saying the producers are saying this is what the price is going to be and you will have to push your price onto the consumer. And I think Devon Woodland yesterday in his State of Affairs message said that pretty clearly. This is a team that I'm talking about, you know, and I understand that, that I don't mean to get in bed, you might say, with a packing industry. That's what, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about setting up some good basic teamwork with you as the producers right on, including the packing industry, where we can make another step in pricing our product as producers, and I think that's very, very important. So with that, I'd like to have the lights back on just for a moment, and I'd like to now turn this meeting over to Larry Sills, the head negotiator at the Home Office. Larry will be going through various programs this morning and we have put together some statistics that I think is going to be surprising to you people here this morning. I don't think it we are going to stand here and predict what's going to happen and what's not going to happen, but I think Larry has some very sound facts that you as producers should take note of and remember. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to turn my meeting over to Larry Sills, which has been with us a couple of years and has been working for myself in the home office as my head negotiator in the hog division for the past four months. And I'm going to let Larry tell you just a little bit about his background. He didn't want to very bad, but I think it's important to you as producers to understand who's working for you. Larry? Gosh, you made it sound like I'm not very proud of where I came from. <laughs> I am. I do want to tell you something about myself. Uh, I think it's uh, very important to you uh, since you, I am under your employ. Uh, I've never been a farmer. Though I have, I started working uh, on farms at the age of 12. Uh, but my dad worked for the packing house industry and he just was not a farmer. I served in the military for a three-year term uh, in the veterinary corps. I was a food inspection specialist and a small animal technician. There I believe I learned uh, where I wanted to go with my life, what I wanted to do, and decided to pursue a career in agriculture. Uh, I then attended South Dakota State University and attained a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science. From South Dakota State University, I went to work for Wilson Certified Foods. And my first job opportunity was with uh, the Omaha Packing Plant uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, where I worked in the meat specialties department. I worked in sales. And before I left Wilson and Company, I worked and managed the beef cooler for the Cherokee Wilson plant. At that time, we were moving between 650 and 850 cattle a day. I left Wilson and Company for personal reasons, not because I did not like Wilson and Company, not because they'd done anything bad to me. Uh, something happened in my life that I thought I had to go home. And I did. And I pursued a career in sales. And I worked and sold to people like yourselves for five years. Now, the initiation of a sales route, uh, as I did, 
was very challenging. It was very interesting. But uh, after some two or three years, uh, when you start making just return calls, uh, the only thing that I really enjoyed about it was getting to talk about the producer's livestock or about his operation, what he was doing. I no longer enjoyed the sales aspect. Now, the thing that happened to me, uh, one must believe in God or one must believe in fate. But my wife picked up an Argus Leader paper in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I have never, I had never read one before. I have never read one since. But uh, she did pick up that paper, and, and that evening, because that paper was there, I picked it up and started paging through it. First, of course, I enjoy sports. I went to the sports page and read the sports. But I happened on an article, a job wanted, and the only thing it said was that hog and cattle grader wanted three years' experience necessary. Now, I did not talk to my wife about this, did not even mention it to her. But I did, in fact, come in the next afternoon early and made that phone call to that number. And uh, the lady answered the phone, NFO. Now, I did not know at that time very much about the NFO. But what I did know was not good. What I thought I knew was not good. But I listened. And the lady told me that the job opportunity was within 18 miles of my door and was to run a collection point facility, which I knew nothing about. She, uh, uh, to put it in perspective, she says like a buying station. That was so I would understand. Not that it is a buying station, but so I would understand it. And I thought, boy, you know, I'd enjoy, I would love to get back into agriculture. So I told them that uh, that day that I would take an interview and take the tests uh, to become a part of this organization. But first, I did some interviewing on my own. You see, I'd been selling to farmers for five years. And I went on the road and I asked every farmer that I talked to for one week, what do you think of the NFO? I had a lot more talk about NFO that week than I did selling. And there were good answers. There were indifferent answers. And there were bad answers. You've all heard them before. But we all, as individuals, follow people that we respect. And I had a couple of producers uh, that were good Christian families, that were what I thought of as progressive farmers. And one of those fellows told me, Larry, I think you would be good for the NFO. And that made me feel very good. And I went home and I talked to my wife. And I told her that I wanted to take, if they offered it to me, this job, no matter what they offered me. I missed agriculture. I love it. And I took the job. And I ran the Dimmock, South Dakota Collection Point for one year. It's a good collection point with good people. Uh, they were running a, a pretty good uh, collection of hogs and cattle when I started. I did get some results there as a collection point manager with the help of people like yourselves because one person does not make it all happen. But with their help, I did go to the country. I did talk to producers. Funny, many of them who've told, who told me time and time again that they were sickened by their price. And I went to talk to them about how, that they, could, how they could change their price and had negative responses. But I worked at, uh, I finished my collection point duties uh, after one year after I was asked to become a regional supervisor. 
and uh, would be in charge then of six collection points. I was on a farmer's place one morning up in Woolsey, South Dakota. And I called into the home office to ask Andy Nutzling when I could get some cattle scheduled for this fellow. Understand that I was working fat cattle, feeder cattle, hogs. Uh, I did not walk by anything because I do believe what Wald has talked about. It is important to the entire body to all commodities. Now, I didn't know a lot about grain, but if they had some, I put them in touch with somebody who knew. I was not a good feeder cattle representative, but I knew cattle pretty well and uh, could put them in touch with somebody that could do it right. But I called into the home office that morning and Andy said, Larry, before you hang up, Merle Sunken wants to talk to you. I was employed by Merle, but I was working all commodities. And Merle asked me, Larry, he said, would you please come down? No, he didn't say please. He said, would you come down? God, I almost did it wrong. <laughs> he said, Larry, would you come down to the home office and spend a couple of weeks with us? And uh, something that I've uh, pushed and talked about uh, since I've been in the organization, I think it's important for anyone in the field to be in the home office from time to time. I also think it is imperative that the personnel within that office get to the country. But uh, he asked me to come in and I thought, boy, this is a chance for me to find out why things don't happen like I think they should sometimes. And I got down there and when I got down there, I found out that Roger Blank was going to retire. And I worked a desk before. I worked it for Wilson. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I missed the personal contact with the producers. But uh, I know I'm there for a reason. And I'm still there. And two weeks is a long time past. And I'll be there for a lot longer because I enjoy what I'm doing. Recently, Pork Council's put together a task force. That task force primary goal is to secure profitability in the pork industry for everybody. Another farm organization, the Farm Bureau, has, after a two-year study, decided that because the packer will pay more money for load lots of hogs that they should put together a collection point system. Of course, I'm not here today to talk to you about other farm organizations. I'm, talk, I'm here to talk to you today about this organization, the organization with a goal and a plan. Now you are all aware that these organizations uh, profitability has been with us all, with you all, since the inception of this organization. Now everyone's got to make a profit to keep it going. And as far as a collection point system, initiated in 1968, people, it's been tried and proven, it works. So a two-year study about whether it might work with the spending of an awful lot of capital could have been done with a phone call. Hey, you people, this organization, it knows it works. What, I'd li what I'm telling you, we all have one goal. We all want to make a profit. We have a chosen profession. We want to stay in it. And I do not understand why we all don't work together. I believe in this organization. 
Today, I want to represent the Hog Division and tell you of a marketing plan and the programs to give you, its members, a variety of marketing programs to cover all the different areas in this vast country. First of all, I want to talk about a marketing plan that was put together some year and a half ago that really only has one fault. It's so simple that some people have a very hard time coping with it. It's called pork peck. You know, they did it, they do it with oil. You all know that it can be done with your agricultural commodities. It's a simple, basic plan to put together the large producers of this country with the many existing collection points to put together the largest, most efficient group of producers ever put together. Through collective bargaining, through collective bargaining, you cause your own marketing to happen. Orderly marketing at a price level where all parties have a margin. We all have to make money. And Merle referred to it as a packer. Now, I'm not in bed with no packer. But we still have to have someone to handle our commodities. I would like to talk about a couple of expanded programs that are an intricate and very important part of this marketing plan. First of all, I would like to talk to you about block contracting. Wall has referred to it. He referred to it in the main meeting last night. He talked about it just a little bit. Uh, Merle will probably cover it uh, a little more. But all block contracting is, is the putting together of a large group of hogs in a depressed area, like has been done in eastern Iowa, to increase the basis of that market and to stimulate an upward trend in the, in the area market. Now, the primary concern with block contracting, and I'm sure most of you have heard uh, the similar, something very similar if you've uh, been into a grain seminar, we need to ensure that this block <coughs> continues to get larger and larger and gets further into the future. And it needs to be adjusted periodically to ensure ourselves that we are staying with the changing future. Now, this block contracting can be applied, I think, in a couple of different ways. First of all, it can be applied as a formulated market. Most of our hog producers today are working with or shipping on a formulated market. Simply, it is the use of a terminal or an interior market as a basis. But what is so important is the advantage to that interior or terminal market through collective bargaining. Another way to go with the block contracting, and I do indeed hope that we go to this uh, I want, uh, I want all of us to go this way someday. Block forward sales contracting can be applied with this block based on the Chicago Mercantile 
not on what the terminal or the interior market is going to do, but on a market that is established two, three, four, six months in advance. So you know your cash flow. You know your return price. Next, I would like to talk to you about forward contracting something that I'm involved with day in and day out, something that I think is vitally important to all of us. What I'm going to do is simply go through some of the many questions that are asked me on a daily basis and try and answer those questions here today for all of you. First of all, what is a forward contract? A forward contract is no more than a guaranteed price on a commitment to deliver in the future. You commit your production for a price to be delivered in the future. What it does consist of is either 30,000 pounds of hogs for a one-month delivery now, or uh, for some packers, uh, that would translate to 135 head. Or what I call uh, a mini contract, or 15,000 pounds, or 70 head. What steps must I go through to get my hogs on a forward contract? Something you, you don't have to do, but I would ask you to do it, is figure your cost of production. It's not necessary. But I think it's important to all of you. I don't understand how anyone can go out into the future and at, uh, set a price on his production if he doesn't know how much it costs going through his own operation. And because someone down the road has a cost of $43 does not mean your cost will be the same. And I think it's important. I think it puts you on the trail to success. Next of all, next you have to set a price. You have to establish a price. And that price will be called in to the home office we will get uh, bits and pieces of information from you so in fact we can mail the contract to you if, if we can attain the level that you've asked us for uh, on the Merck. And next I'd like to talk about the difference between the Chicago Mercantile price and the price that you receive and it's something I get tons and hundreds of questions on. Why the Chicago Mercantile quotes a market of $50, and when I tell you what your price is going to be, I tell you it's going to be 46 and a half. And you say, well, you know, I don't understand. Where's that other money going? Well, first of all, you do not pay margin money. You do not pay upfront money for your contracting. The packer does. Part of that money is... Uh, on there to take those hogs to Chicago. And you say, I don't deliver my hogs to Chicago. Well, that is the basis where the hogs are sold. Now, it's immaterial whether you're, you may be taking them to uh, Louisville, Kentucky. That doesn't make any difference. Uh, the basis, uh, part of the money has to go to get them back to Chicago. The other part of that money is that protection money that the packer takes to cover his margin money, to cover his upfront money, to protect himself in the wild fluctuations and gyrations in the mercantile market. Now, I don't like the basis, and I know most producers don't like it. But the bottom line is the price you receive. I'm going to say this over and over again. The bottom line is the price you receive 
and the end result at the end of the year. Is my balance sheet black or is my balance sheet red? Why should I forward contract my hogs with the National Farmers Organization when I can simply go to my broker and hedge those hogs on the board myself? Number one, I've already said it, part of it. You have no margin money. You don't have to make those margin calls. You don't have to pay me upfront money. The most important reason is that hedging your hogs on the board will never 